Okay, and now uh, for the final speaker of this session, we have Ariel Chipman from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who will talk about the evolution of segmentation. Be nice to okay. That's not what I should be saying there. <coughs> Check this earlier. <laughs> okay. People usually ask me at conferences how many Evo Devo people there are working in Israel, and my answer is usually two. There's Rami and there's me, and I thank the organizers for proving me wrong. Uh, it's actually been very uh, enlightening and very, um, very positive to see how many different people there are working in Israel on various questions that interface with evolutionary developmental, evo evolutionary developmental biology. This should actually not come as too much of a surprise because one of the things that Evo Devo proponents have always claimed is that Evo Devo is a field that more than almost any other biological field takes data from different subdisciplines of biology and um, tries to merge them to answer evolutionary <coughs> questions. And what I want to do in this talk is talk about the evolution of segmentation. I will talk, uh, talk about two very different types of data, one coming directly from developmental biology and one coming from morphology and paleontology. And I'll be talking, as I said, specifically about segmentation. And maybe I should give some, uh, some background what segmentation is and how I define segmentation. Segmentation is, is a metaphenomenon. It's not a single trait. It's a combination of, uh, of morphological traits in which one sees the repetition of various different body units along the anterior-posterior axis. And these can be units coming from the muscle system, from the bone system, appendages, nervous system, excretory system, etc. And these different units that come from different systems are bundled together in one morphological unit that we refer to as a segment. And if we look at metazoans, and more specifically the bidatarians, we see that that segmentation appears in several different branches of the tree. So for example, we see chordates, which Rami just talked about, and, and chordates have very obvious segmentation. This is most obvious if we look at the skeleton, but this is also true in various other. This is most obvious if we look at the skeleton, such as in the snake but the muscles are segmented, the nervous system is also segmented, excretory system at least primitively is segmented. So chordates are very clearly a segmented phylum. Arthropods are maybe the most obvious segmented phylum because the borders between the segments are obvious externally, they are external annulations, they are external borders between body segments. The sister group to the arthropods are the onocophorans or velvet worms are actually not really segmented. We see repeated, we see repeated appendages, and there's some, dis some debate about whether their nervous system is segmented, but we don't see the external segmentation that's so obvious in arthropods. We don't see the, the cuticular divisions between one segment and the next. The third segmented phylum are the annelids, or the, uh, the round worms, represented here by, uh, by Nereus, some marine segmented worm. And again, as in arthropods, there are clear segmental boundaries, and there are units of different body systems clustered together in each segment. Now, if we look at the spread of segmentation throughout bilaterians, we can see that we see segmented phyla in the three major superphyla um, within animals. So we see a deuterostrone group, an ecdysozoan group, and a lophotrochozoan group. And this begs the question of whether the fact that we see segmentation in all three superphyla means that the common ancestor of these three was segmented, and the common ancestor of these three is the common ancestor of all bilaterians because they're in three different groups. So was the erbilaterian, as it is known, a segmented animal, or has segmentation arisen independently three times or maybe two times throughout the, uh, the evolution of animals? And there, one of the ways of looking at this question is to try and see how the segmented body plan is generated in each one of these phyla and to try and reconstruct the ancestral state of each one of these phyla and then compare the ancestral state between the three. Uh, now, another thing that I I'm, should also mention is that this is a simplified tree of, of metazoans. And though I've shown only about 10 phyla here, there are, as we heard yesterday, some 30 phyla. And if segmentation arose once at the base of bilaterians, that would mean that it has been lost in 25, 28 different phyla. So, so there's, a, there's a difficulty here. Most of what I'll talk about will be within arthropods. That's the phylum we know the most about developmentally. 
And what I've shown here in this, again, simplified phylogeny of arthropods with the major arthropod groups marked out here, I've shown all the species where there has been lab work on segmentation. And we can see that there are many different species where we know at least something about how the segmented body plan is generated. And we have at least two species of cholesterates. We have two species of myriapods. We have a couple of species of crustaceans and many species of insects. I haven't even listed all the insects here for which we know at least something about the development of segmentation. The developmental, that is, I mean embryology of segmentation. And until about 10 or 15 years ago, what we knew about segmentation in arthropods came from the so-called Drosophila paradigm. And anyone who's ever taken a course in developmental biology has seen this scheme or some version of it. And in Drosophila, segments are generated through a sequential hierarchical process. So the first stage is definition of the axes of the embryos through maternally deposited factors. Then there's a group of genes known as gap genes that divide the embryo into broad domains. The interactions of the gap genes activate primary and secondary parallel genes, which divide the embryo into two segmental repeats or into pairs of segments. And the interactions of the parallel genes ultimately generate the actual segments and activate a group of genes known as segment polarity genes. And each one of these segment polarity genes is expressed in a single segment. Now the question is whether this scheme is applicable to arthropods in general, and I can already tell you the answer. It's a very strong no. Uh, and as we can see in Drosophila, all the segments are generated simultaneously. Most arthropods generate segments very differently. Most arthropods generate segments sequentially. There's a group of segments, usually four to six, maybe eight segments, that are generated more or less at once. And then more segments are added one at a time from the posterior of the embryo. Now, if we want to, so as I said, in Drosophila, segments are generated segment simultaneously. This is not the norm for arthropods. In an animal that's generating segments sequentially, there are a few basic instructions, a few basic stages that the embryo has to follow to generate a segmented body plan. The first stage is to define the body axis. If segments are being added from the posterior, the animal has to decide, or the embryo has to decide where the posterior is. And this is actually usually determined in the egg already. So the egg is inherently asymmetrical, either by shape or, as we heard earlier, by point of sperm entry. So the body axis is already there, but molecularly the body axis has to be defined. So the genes that are specific to each pole of the, of the animal have to be defined. Once the posterior is defined, the axis has to be elongated from the posterior end. So what we defined as the back end of the embryo has to grow and elongate. And once this axis is elongating, a repeated pattern has to be generated that will be overlain on this elongating axis. What I'm going to do now is go through these three stages and initially fo focusing on arthropods, talk about how each one of these stages takes place in different arthropods, what is conserved, and I'll look both at the morphological level and at the molecular level. So defining the AP axis, I've already said, is often defined morphologically before the molecular players start, uh, start kicking in. But at the molecular level, for example, caudal, which was also mentioned in the context of nematodes, is a very conserved posterior determinant. It's found basically in all metazoans that have been looked at, and it's always expressed in the posterior, and it's always important for determining the posterior of the embryo. Natnos and Hunchback are two other genes, two other genes that interact with each other and are also very <coughs> highly conserved, all the way down even to Cnidarians. And the interaction between Hunchback and Nanos defines the anterior and posterior of the embryo. Now, we know that these genes are active in other, we've found them in other animals, but we actually know relatively little about them outside of insects. But we can still assume that the, the basic interaction between the two is fairly conserved. Now, this is a very important point, the origin of the anterior posterior axis. That is, the fact that an anterior posterior axis exists at all definitely predates the radiation of the arthropods. Since all bilaterians inherently have an anterior posterior axis, we can assume that this axis is ancient. We can also assume that the genes involved in generating this axis are ancient. And this has nothing to do with segmentation. So whether you're segmented or not segmented, you have an anterior posterior axis, and you probably use these same genes. Looking at elongating an axis, I want to focus on 
two model species, both animals that I've worked on or in the process of working on, centipedes and crayfish. This is Strigamia maritima, it's a European coastal, European coastal centipede which formed the focus of my postdoctoral work. This is what the animal looks like. This is the mother brooding the eggs. This is what an embryo looks like stained with a fluorescent nuclear marker. You can see this is the head. You can see the segments. You can tell that it's a centipede because there are very many segments here and there are more segments being formed here. This is a crayfish. This is Cherax, which is an Australian species. This is what the embryo looks like, the eyes, the head, mouth parts, and this is the axis, which is elongating and actually twisting backwards on itself ventrally. Now, how does Strigamia elongate the axis? The embryo is initially a ball, or the egg is a ball, and the embryo starts out as a hemisphere that covers roughly 60% of the area of the embryo. These are schematics of the embryo viewed from the side and flattened out viewed from above. At some point, we start seeing an extension of what will be the head, the anterior part of the embryo, sticks out and starts elongating. And the way it elongates is by recruiting tissue from what remains of this posterior disc or what starts out as this hemisphere. Remains as an undifferentiated posterior disc, one or two cell layers thick, that's all. Cells are moving, going through this very important transition zone and being added to the germ band. And the transition zone is, is the interesting bit. This is where segments are being formed, both morphologically and molecularly. This computer is slow. In crayfish, axis, the axis is elongated very differently. This is typical for Malacostric crustaceans, a very large group within crustaceans. There's a series of cells in the posterior, which are stem cells. They're known as teloblasts or ectoteloblasts. And they divide asymmetrically. And every asymmetrical division gives rise to one daughter cell, which maintains stem cellness, and one daughter cell that then goes on to divide several more times. And the axis is elongated simply by these ectoteloblasts dividing. So in contrast with the centipede where we have tissue that's already there and is being recruited to the axis, here we have new tissue that's being generated through cell division. And this is summarized in this slide. So we saw that in Drosophila there's no elongation at all. All the segments are there from the very beginning. In the centipede we see recruitment of existing tissue to elongate the axis. And in malacostric and crustaceans we see the generation of new tissue by sequential cell divisions. And I have to point out that these are two extremes. So most arthropods do something that's in between, that's something intermediate. So there's a combination of cell movement and cell division. But I like these two examples just because they, they illustrate the two opposite ways of elongating an axis that one can find in arthropods. At the molecular level, we've already mentioned caudal as a posterior determinant. It's also involved in elongation. There are many examples within arthropods if you knock out caudal, you lose all axis elongation. The embryo truncates. It forms the first few segments and doesn't go any further. Something very similar is seen in even skipped. And even skipped, I should point out, is a parallel gene in Drosophila. So it actually has a much later role in Drosophila development. In many arthropods, it has a role that's similar to caudal. And even skipped is also conserved among other bilaterians. Wind genes, this data from the last two or three years, we now know that wind genes are very heavily involved in axis elongation. If you knock out wind genes, again, you lose all elongation of the axis. The embryo is truncated. And this is also true in vertebrates, as an aside. And the ancestral form of axis elongation is subterminal addition. So we saw both in the centipede and in the crayfish that there is still tissue posterior to where the axis is being elongated. So the axis is being elongated from the posterior, but not from the very posterior. There's always something behind there. And as the axis is being elongated, sequential segmentation is happening within this elongating tissue. And very often people put axial elongation and segmentation together as one process, but they're probably different. And as we can see, um, they're, they're disjunct. And even though they're happening at the same time, they're run by different molecular players. So how do we generate this repeated pattern? How do we uh, make segments? Theoretically, from the mid-70s, there have been uh, theoretical models or mathematical models suggesting how segments can be generated or how repeated patterns can be generated. The clock and wavefront model from um, Jonathan Cook from 1976 is the most famous, but the various versions of it, cellular oscillators, say basically the same thing. And what these models say is that you have 
some kind of oscillator, some kind of clock that's generating a sine wave. And this sine wave is a sine wave that's moving in time in space. So it's a, it's a traveling wave. And as this traveling wave moves, it meets some kind of wavefront, of some kind of signal coming from the opposite direction. And this signal coming from the opposite direction causes the traveling wave to stop at some point. And depending on what state a cell is in when the oscillator signal is stopped, it adopts different types of morphological fates. This is demonstrated, just look at the bottom here. We can see this traveling wave that is starting from the posterior, is moving anteriorly. At some point, it becomes fixed. And cells that are at a high phase, at a high stage within the, the cycling phase, are fixed at one cellular fate. Cells that are in a low, in a different phase, are fixed at a different cellular fate. And so we have a traveling wave pattern being translated into a morphological repeating pattern. And this is exactly what has been found to be happening exactly in vertebrate segmentation or somatogenesis. And this is mediated through a well-studied molecular pathway, which is the Notch signaling pathway, the Notch delta signaling pathway. Just briefly, Notch and delta are both extracellular presented molecules. Delta is the ligand, Notch is the receptor. Inherently, generates a repeating pattern. So if you have something that's down-regulating itself, and there's a delay in there, that generates a cycling pattern. And this is what we see in vertebrates. Uh, and we see this mostly manifested in hairy family genes that are oscillating and moving, just as shown in the schematic here, from the pre-Semitic mesoderm, from the undifferentiated posterior of the, of the <laughs> vertebrate mesoderm, and forming somites. Several years ago, it turned out that delta notch signaling, which is well known in vertebrates, is also active in spiders. And if you knock down notch and delta in spiders, you lose or you disrupt segmentation. If you look at the expression of notch and delta, if you look at the expression of hairy, which is not in this slide, but is also from the same paper, you see that they're also varying segmentally, very similar to what's happening in vertebrates. And from my own work on centipedes, we found that delta is also involved in segmentation. And it is expressed in a traveling wave, very similar to the traveling wave that we see in somatogenesis in vertebrates. So these are three embryos with three different stages viewed from three different directions. And we can see delta expression, which is expressed like ripples in a pond as a traveling wave that's moving across the from the undifferentiated posterior and eventually fixing to form segmental boundaries in the segmented germ band. And this is now also known to be true in cockroaches, so in insects, in basal insects. And again, if we compare the centipede and, uh, and the crustacean in how they generate a repeating pattern, so in, in the centipede we have a traveling wave that's moving across undifferentiated tissue and becoming fixed. And this is very similar to the vertebrate model. In crayfish, I said this but didn't really focus, each one of these cell divisions that are generating new tissue are actually generating a new segment. Because every daughter cell from the division of these teloblasts is the precursor of a single segment. So the generation of a repeated pattern is inherent in the, in the extension of the axis. There's no, there's no disjunction between the two as there is in centipedes. So every cell division that's extending is also generating a repeated pattern. There's no need for any kind of traveling wave or cycling pattern to be overlain on the extending germ band. So trying to, to move out from arthropods to bilaterians in general, so as I've hinted, but I'll say this again, there are several molecular pathways that are conserved within different segmented phyla. Notch pathway, for example, I've shown is what does that mean, seven minutes or five, four, three? OK. Uh, I'll speed up, as usual. So notch pathway, wind signaling, et cetera, posterior patterning through cordal and nanos are all involved in generating segments in various segmented phyla. And this is interpreted by many people as evidence for segmented bilaterian ancestor for complex or bilaterian. Different arthropods represent segmentation patterns that are similar to segmented phyla. I've already shown that. There's some aspects in centipede segmentation that look like vertebrates. There's some aspects in um, crustacean segmentation that look like annelids. And this is, again, perhaps some vestige of ancestral features. But if we look at fossils, we see a very different picture. 
So there's no convincing evidence for segmentation in the earliest bilaterians. And even if we look at the stem taxa of each one of the three superphyla, what we know from fossils, there is no evidence of real segmentation. If we look at basal deuterostomes, basal ecdysosomes, basal ophotrochosomes, there's no evidence for segmentation in there. But still, you see in many paleontological papers, when somebody finds a segmented fossil, they push it to the bottom of the tree, to the base of the tree, because we know from molecular data that segmentation is ancestral to all bilaterians. I just want to strengthen what I've said here in a few words by, by showing you trees of the three superphyla. So starting with deuterostomes, um, we have ambulacraria up here, we have chordates here, uh, and black means fully segmented, light gray is unsegmented, and medium gray is something in between. I'll show you what I mean. For example, we have the Cambrian picaya, which is very clearly segmented. This isn't, no, it can't be. Okay. Um, Okay, so we have the ancestor of what is close to the ancestor of chordates, which is very clearly segmented. Let's just run through this. Um, if we look at all the fossils, we can see that the ancestor of deuterostomes probably had segmental gill slits. And that's probably an ancient feature of deuterostomes in general. But true somites, true segmentation, is something that's typical of the chordate branch. In ecdysozoans, we have arthropods, which are truly segmented, and I'll just run through the fossils because I've been cooked out. Uh, again, we see that true segmentation is a trait of the arthropod clade. We see metamerism in sister groups of the arthropods, lobopods, etc. We see some evidence of partial segmentation and metamerism in some of the sister groups when there's scalodophorans, but again, no true segmentation in the base of ecdysozoans. Lophotrochosomes, the picture is even clearer because there are basically no segmented fossils uh, of ecdysozoans. Let's just look at one. This is Kimberella, which is a diacrine, so it's, it's pre-Cambrian, and is the earliest accepted bilaterian, and is very clearly Lophotrochozoan, but it's unsegmented. And other ancient Lophotrochozoans are also unsegmented. So the base of Lophotrochozoa is very clearly unsegmented. So let's go back to... Uh, the two data sets we have. So molecular data sets suggest that notch, delta, et cetera, are all ancestral in segmentation. But many of these pathways, and this is maybe the most important point here, many of these pathways have an ancient role in axis determination or axis elongation. They are already there in the posterior of the embryo. They're already doing something there, and they can be very easily recruited multiple times to generate a repeated pattern. And the fact that we see similar patterns in, in cellular, these are just different mechanical solutions to, to similar problems. Now, an important point here, and this, again, ties with things that people have said, the segmented body plan is highly evolvable, if I may use that word again. Segmentation may have appeared for various different reasons, probably having to do with locomotion. Once it's there, once you have a segmented body plan, it's extremely modular. You can modify, you can add things, you can change things, you can specialize different parts of the body. So once there is a phylum that has invented segmentation, it becomes very successful. Not because segmentation in itself is so good, but because it allows multiple solutions to different ecological problems and allows very easy evolution. I want to end by acknowledging people who have helped in ideas and comments. Michael Aikam, who was my postdoc supervisor and got me interested in segmentation in the first place. Wallace Arthur, uh, who introduced us to the centipede. Yogi Jaeger from Barcelona, who's worked on, on theoretical models of segmentation. Phil Donahue and Graham Budd are both invertebrate paleontologists who have commented on versions of this, this paper. The, full version of this talk is going to appear in bioessays in January, so you can read all the details there. David Weisblatt works on annelids. And none of what I've said today actually comes from my lab, from the stuff that's happening in my lab at the moment, because the lab is still in very early stages, but I think it's important to acknowledge the people in the lab, because the, what they're doing today is what I'll talk about in my talks in a year or two. So Mila Cohen is my technician and uh, holds everything together. Jonathan, Michael, and Anat are three graduate students who are working on a system that I didn't mention at all, which is the milkweed bug, and we're interested in early patterning, axis determination, and uh, differentiation within that. Ruth and, almost there, Ruth and Yael are uh, both charged with a very difficult and very frustrating task of developing the crayfish model 
uh, which is a very interesting system to work on, but unfortunately is not working yet. And Tal Nagan uh, is doing a bioinformatic project. And Tal and Jonathan have posters. And thank you for listening and for letting me run over time. So we have time for uh, one question. Um, anyone? Nama. Nama. Um, I have a question about dorsal ventral patterning. So ah. it's okay. So okay. It, in the spider, there, are indi there is a report that in the spider there is exit duplication. There are also kind of what you see in the vertebrate or the Spearman organizer. Do you see this also in the, in, in the other vertebrate, in the other invertebrate that you're looking at? Are there other species where it's being observed? Well, the dorsal ventral axis is actually inverted in chordates. The ancestral dorsal ventral axis is found in everybody else except for chordates, uh, not just spiders. Um, spiders are typical of arthropods and typical of, of most other invertebrates. But I mean the phenomena that you can get duplicated. Oh, duplicated, not, yeah, not inverted. I didn't know about duplicate axis in spiders. Yeah, hmm? there is, okay, I'll, we can talk later. Okay, there is one report no. that, sh that showed that you can get them, like, twinned. You can knock down, I think it's BMP, and then you get the axis duplicated, but that, that just has to do with, with the way the axis is formed. It's not an actual phenomenon, as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.